personal views and opinions expressed by our podcast guests are their own and are not legal advice or official statements by their organizations. Hello, my name is Debbie Reynolds, and this is the Data Diva Talk Privacy Podcast, where we discuss data privacy issues with industry leaders around the world with information that you need to know right now. Today, I have a special guest on the show, uh, Peter Barbosa. He is the CEO of Opsquare Data. He's a Canadian. I like Canadians. I know people heard me say that a lot. Uh, And I'm really happy to have you on the show. Thanks for having me, Debbie. Really happy to be here as well. Yeah. So I always like to tell a little backstory about how I met people. So Peter actually contacted me on LinkedIn and we started having kind of early discussions about, you know, his tool and the things that they were doing. And so we always try to touch base every couple months, right, uh, for a while now, find out how things are doing, you know, what's happening on your roadmap, looking at your tool and stuff like that. And I've been really impressed with how you're really thinking about the problem of data and how people have to deal with it in privacy. So I guess part of it to me is like, okay, people know that these regulations are coming up and they have to respond to that. But then also just as kind of a housekeeping thing, they just need to get more of a better handle on what they have and to be able to take action on it. So give me some, uh, give the folks an overview of, of Opsware data and what you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, prior to, you know, a few weeks ago, we were known as a tool called Privacy Request. And we actually originally went to market our tool um, early this year. And we quickly found out, and, you know, we even spoke with you as well prior, Debbie. And, you know, you and a lot of other folks who we connect with over at LinkedIn were pretty integral with helping structure the roadmap and helping prioritize what we're building next and like who our customer focus really is. Um, and that's one thing, you know, we, we benefited a lot from uh, initially early days, but even when we went to market, you know, our name was Privacy Request, but we kind of knew already that like the future of what we were focusing on and the bigger issue a lot of companies were facing that we were speaking with, um, which are a lot of B2B SaaS companies, um, we managed to kind of break down certain char- characteristics we look for within those well. Um, but we quickly realized the bigger issue, and if you really want to have an effective data subject request program or policy behind your business, it really starts with understanding your data and where it is and why you collect data and what data you can keep and what data you can't and what data you can throw away if you can and minimize. Um, and that's really how we kind of started this is, you know, first let's start with the customer. Let's figure out what is the highest urgency to them. Um, what do they need to be effective and to have proper governance of, you know, their data uh, and their privacy program as well. Uh, and that's really how we started this. So we, we originally launched with, you know, with a deep specialization in data subject requests and also the data mapping as well. Um, And we kind of quickly, as soon as we got to market, kind of use a lot of early stage feedback. There's a lot of piloting happening. We really kind of focus a lot of the roadmap around data mapping and understanding what days within there. So we realized that a lot of privacy teams or privacy professionals, they didn't have the right resources and tools in place to actually capture what was happening downstream or what's happening within the business. And that's really what we started working on is building a really strong workflow to help scale your privacy operations. And that's one thing we do really well is we help companies scale, speed, and automate their privacy operations within a single workflow. And that's really been what's standing out. Yeah. The the, the thing with privacy enhancing tech, uh, you know, obviously is a newer market and people are kind of sort of sort, sorting themselves out and trying to figure out how to distinguish and position themselves. But I wouldn't say it's two different groups. I think it's more than two groups, but a lot of times people confuse, especially the word data mapping. So data mapping can mean many things. It can mean I have a napkin and I jot things down and put charts together and stuff, or it can mean that I touch data. So for me, when I'm thinking about data mapping, I ask people, does your application touch data or not? So you either touch data or you don't touch data. And the the apps that don't touch data, it's more of kind of a paper exercise. So it's documentation and information about what happens with data, kind of explaining that story as opposed to getting the actual tangible insights from what's truly happening within the business with data. What are your thoughts? 
Yeah, I 100% agree. Um, the terminology is like it's it's loosely used, right? Um, <clears throat> I think it depends if you're speaking with a security professional versus an engineer versus you know someone who's more in legal on the legal side of privacy. I think what that output of a data map looks like could be drastically different. Um, really, kind of if you break it down though, and you look at the individual elements, you start to see a lot of commonalities between them. Um, for example, you know, watching the flow of like from a technical standpoint, you know, a data map could be like a data flow diagram or could be something similar to an entity relationship diagram like an ERD. Um, but you can even use those diagrams to build out more of what I call like the, you know, an Article 30 GDPR record of processing, or you know, that's what we often refer to as data map as well in a legal context. You can still kind of extract particular pieces of a data flow diagram and use that for your actual, you know, um, record of processing ROP often let's refer to. Um, but I 100% agree with you. There is a lot of, you know, terminology that's thrown around. Uh, around that word data mapping. And really it can be confusing sometimes around the audience as far as what type of data map they're gonna be getting out of it. Um, you know, we try to sit on both sides of the fences. Um, you know, we really focus on, we think privacy can only be accomplished at a business when it's cross-functional. Uh, it's really a cross-functional task. Um, so we try to build a tool that's kind of more inclusive of everyone, uh, kind of speaks all languages. Yeah, I like the fact that you're talking about it being cross-functional because data is everywhere in enterprises, especially when you're thinking about privacy, it touches everyone. So having people in place that can help kind of bridge those gaps and sort of, you know, get people out of those silos in some ways and understand, how, you know, what parts that different people play within the organization and how they can kind of come together to like achieve a common goal. Yeah, absolutely. And I think otherwise, there's just a lot of assumptions that are made on either side, um, which is what we've seen in reality um, that, you know, you get these typical questionnaires being sent around and either the person receiving it doesn't have the right context um, or the person sending it knows they're not going to get the right information back and they tend to assume a lot sometimes. Um, so you've really seen things kind of go both sides. And that was really one of the big issues that we, we or one of the pain points we focus on is you know, what's like the highest risk, like what's the highest risk when doing this process? And can we automate that? And we'll automate as much as we can, but you can't automate everything. And I think that's something that we see a lot of other tools do so they can automate everything. Um, but really there's still some manual steps involved to get that end result um, that they're looking for, especially, you know, I'm speaking in context of that, you know, more that that records of processing, that, that legal data map that we're speaking of. So I think, when you're thinking of, um, uh, when I think about, when I look at like the fine, so companies that have been fined for data privacy things, they're almost always, I've like literally, literally not seen one that, that, that in this case, it hasn't been true, that they get fined on what they do and not what they say they do. So understanding operationally what's happening with your data is really important, uh, especially if, let's say, for example, let's say legal says you do one thing based on kind of what their map is or record processing is, but the actuality is that the data was handled in some different way, then it makes you look not great <laughs> to regulators because, it, you know, in some ways it makes it seem like you're, you know, not being truthful when really it can be a deep misunderstanding within the organization, not like something that's, um, that's intentional or malicious in any way. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, again, something I run into a lot, um, you know, I often start with reading a privacy policy on the website when I'm speaking with someone. Um, and then, you know, when you kind of start to understand downstream what's happening or we, we plug in our tool, we start to see there's actually some differences with what they're saying they're doing versus what they're actually doing. And I think that's a bigger gap we see in the space. You know, everyone, want, everyone wants to say they're transparent. They want to be transparent. Um, but what they're actually doing is often very different. So it's actually like verifying what they're doing, which is, you know, the biggest gap and my biggest irk um, that, you know, I'd like to solve, my biggest itch I'd like to solve. Um, because I have that same hesitation myself as, a, as an individual or a data subject as my like, we need being a data subject, um, you know, maybe I just lack some trust on some of these random online companies I find, but I always read the privacy policy and ask, is this actually why, the, you know, are they disclosing all the reasons why they collect or process my data or all the uses they have of my data? 
you know, is our subprocessor list actually accurate? Are there any other third parties here? Um, I think that's an ongoing issue. And I think having an automated data, data mapping tool that can actually plug in and tell you that is super beneficial to a lot of companies, um, especially once you hit a certain size. I mean, certainly, you know, a startup under 100 employees, I think they can, you know, get by, they might be able to get by doing something more manual out of Excel, providing they, you know, have some good practices or has a good culture around data collection um, and data minimization. Um, but certainly, I think, you know, once you hit a certain size and there's a lot of silos happening within the organization, you know, putting in a tool to actually validate what you're saying you're doing is, is critical. Um, and again, to your point, I, I think it goes beyond fines and penalties. You know, we speak with a lot of, we're starting to break down, understand companies a bit different than we did in the past, where we really look at individual characteristics of these companies uh, to understand where they're at with the maturity of privacy. And I think that's, that's a big indicator as far as, you know, what's the, like, once you understand the maturity of their privacy program, you start to see different drivers, you start to see commonalities amongst them, if they have those characteristics, as far as what their drivers are for, for pushing in, for, you know, enhancing a privacy program or implementing a privacy program as well. Yeah, I agree with that. I agree with that. Uh, yeah, your your walk and your talk need to match. <laughs> yeah. So that's very important. So don't say you delete stuff every 30 days and you don't do that. Like, that's so bad. <laughs> that's so, so bad. Uh, let's talk a little bit about data retention. Uh, this is a topic that I like to talk about a lot, mostly because it's the most unsexy thing that you can discuss. Like, no one wants to talk about that. So it's yeah. like, uh, you know, you think about digital transformation, people love that because it's like, oh, we have this new thing, we have a new product process, you know, in within organization, it's, a, it's these are the products to get the most attention because, you know, you put your best people on it, you roll it out, it's kind of the new hot thing. But then let's say this application ages out, maybe your company has changed in some way that the application doesn't like meet your needs anymore, you want to go out to market to do something else. Then you have this data, this legacy data that's sort of lingering around. And a lot of times, you know, it's put on a server in a back room somewhere that no one really cares about. And so that data, you know, what I've noticed is that data that has lagging or lower business value over time can be the highest risk to organizations in terms of data breach and stuff like that. Cause they, they don't get, they don't put that stuff on the best systems. They don't put it on like the most secure locations. You know, the, the knowledge about the data leaves the organization over years. So, you know, typically some, you know, Jasper down the hall, he's the only one that knows about this data or something like that. So these are huge risks and we're seeing big, big um, data breaches happening with organizations where this exactly what happened is like, this is not like high value data to them at this point because they've used it and done whatever, but it's still sticking around within the organization. So talk to me a little bit about your thoughts about kind of that, you know, the afterglow of uh, digital transformation and what happens at the end. Yeah, I think you, you said a lot of very great points there. Um, there is a cost around holding legacy data and retaining it for a long time, right? Um, and more times than none, I think companies are starting to find that they cost a lot more than what the benefit actually is. And I think naturally, you know, I used to be, go back in my day, I used to be an, an IT service provider. I used to go around to businesses and help them set up their infrastructure and, and you know, their racks of servers, all that kind of stuff. And there was, ever back then, there was such a, you know, of, of keeping all the emails you can. And, you know, sometimes you see, you know, these PST email files are like 20 or 30 gigs and like it's going years back. And you're really wondering why they're really retaining all this data. It's more of a comfort thing, I think, that come, individuals need to get over um, and kind of, you know, reflect that kind of upwards throughout their company. Uh, but there is a high cost to that, you know, you, you don't maintain that as much. You're not going to migrate it over to a newer platform. Uh, and it's probably not even worth at that point. Um, but I strongly believe that companies do need a strong retention policy. But even beyond that, I think even bigger than just having a retention policy is minimizing the places that collect data. Um, right. Like when I think, you know, when I think of an important part of, it, of digital transformation, it is like a, an important piece that is minimizing data and where you're storing data. And going through an auditing, you know, who that's shared with, what countries it's in, et cetera. I think, you know, data minimization is often overlooked um, for companies. And I think that's something that a lot of companies should do before they even start to consider perhaps programs. Because um, there's been a lot that we run into where, you know, there may be a 200 person business 
Um, you know, they've, they've grown fast. They have different departments and different silos that are starting to develop. Um, and they kind of let everyone go free reign for a while. And they start to bring in a legal person or someone who has conduct of privacy. And there's often a lot of, you know, we'll call it, you know, debt, like kind of like tech debt that to go back and fix up. Um, but I find, you know, if you're going to do that, if, if you're trying to be, a, if you're a founder or, you know, you're operating a business, it's going to be a lot easier to have that mindset out of the gate of actually, you know, minimizing the data you collect and the data you retain as well and where you do that. And if you look at data breaches too, like, you know, a lot of these data breaches are not from the company's data controller itself. It's often those third-party processors. Um, and if you can minimize that risk, you're, you know, or if you can minimize how many, you know, processors there are within your ecosystem, then you're probably going to minimize your risk overall. Yeah. I think third parties get a little bit of a bad rap though. Um, people kind of, you know, there is third party risk, right? And so, but it's, um, is a handshake thing. So it's, uh, you know, it takes two to tango in my opinion. Yeah. So it's like, okay, I get this third party, this data, you know, what do they do with it? You know, and most of those promises are, are maintained via contracts. So, okay. This third party needs to do this. They need to have this security thing or whatever, but the, you know, that also means that there's a responsibility for the first party data holder as well. So, you know, like I know some of the past bigger breaches, you know, the story was, okay, I gave this third party my uh, my data. They had a, like a login to my system. And then once they were in the system, they were able to kind of run, run ragged and just run all over the system. But it's like if their access was limited to begin with, it would be limited damage that they can do. So what, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, to your point, like the, the first party who's initially collecting the data, like they still have an obligation as well to make sure that that third party is me of the expectation of that contract. And I think that's one thing that probably an area where a lot of folks, I wouldn't say they fall short on, maybe it's more of a bandwidth constraint from my understanding within the company itself and that, you know, that privacy team where, you know, you should go back and you should review these contracts. You should, you know, audit your vendors and your third parties to make sure they are holding up to what they say they are. Um, so yeah, I think you're right. It does take two to tango. It is a handshake that has to happen on both sides. Um, and also I don't know if there's really currently a good way of, you know, effectively doing that audit of them being a very manual process. And, you know, that's probably from what we hear anyways, and we see companies do internal reviews. That's a once a year thing sometimes. Um, certainly they can have a tighter loop between that. Um, but no, I think you're, I think you're bang on it. It does take both. Um, which is, which is a bit of a challenge. I think maybe there's not, yeah, I think that, that there's a struggle there currently that we see with a lot of companies we speak to, um, right now. Yeah. Um, uh, when too, too you, much of the, too much of the set and forget it, I think. Yes. Too much of the set and, and forget it. And then, you know, I think what happens a lot of times is that people give third parties too much access. So, in order to give, you know, if you give someone granular access, that takes more time than to give them broad access. <laughs> yep. So if someone is on your case and they're like, hey, we need this person to have access, this person is really important and they need to have access right away. Maybe the, the person who's giving them access to make it faster, give them, you know, a lot of access. <laughs> they don't spend time to, to make it more granular as it should be and then if those credentials get out of hand or someone else you know takes a look at it it makes it easy for them to get into the organization because you you know didn't really secure your organization in a way to minimize the damage that a third party could do to your operation yeah 100 percent agree there as well um it does come down to, yes, yeah, like saving time, being efficient, and that individual stakeholder, you know, as a privacy officer or someone who champions privacy in the organization. Um, you know, when you're going off and, and you put an ask out to your team, you know, perhaps someone in DevOps in this case, or someone from the security team needs to give access to their firewall, what have you. Um, I think a lot of times it's just like, I'm just going to complete this task as fast as I can and move on to the next thing because, you know, we have a million other things going on in my mind. You know, uh, you know, as a security professional, you're focusing, you know, you're probably prioritizing your tasks around business value and you're probably not thinking about the big picture here. And it comes down to this, to this bigger challenge that we hear all the time, which is like privacy awareness, right? The mindset of privacy, the culture of privacy. 
um, is often a kind of a good area to start and focus on to actually kind of, you know, build a lot of protection around tasks and asks like this that someone from privacy might have to the team. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's another major, major issue we hear a lot of just like privacy awareness, private, so I mean, just, you don't need necessarily need, I don't think training would really enhance that, but it's having the mindset of privacy and the maturity around and like having the mindset of that and like understanding, um, I guess building in that, that, that culture across your business of why it's important to protect data and why it's important to use those safeguards, right? Um, Cause as a security professional, you probably know it's better to have more granular controls uh, or an individual to have more granular access versus more broader access. Um, but at the time, it's, but at the time, probably, you know, the individual might be thinking, hey, you know, like this is a trusted vendor. They've gone through our vetting process. They're held liable. I'm not too concerned this time. And I think that changes as, as the company grows as well. And it becomes even more challenging to, to implement. Yeah, I agree with that. So I, I think, you know, I guess I want to throw it back into third party again. So this is what I'm seeing. I feel like there's kind of this wave that's happening that people aren't really understanding that's going to happen. So we saw with the GDPR, and they've probably done it best so far, is try to determine what is the responsibility for a like a data controller who's the, the company that has the data, the first party data, and then the processor is going to do this task on behalf of the company. So I feel like the GDPR did it best so far in terms of trying to uh, determine what are the obligations of those kind of two groups. And so what I'm seeing that people really aren't paying attention to now is there are a lot of other laws since the GDPR came out that are replicating that framework where they're saying, okay, first party data holders, you have this responsibility. Third party data holders, you have responsibility. So they can't be decoupled from one another. So it's like, again, this handshake thing where you have to work together. So in the U.S., what we're having now is these states passing these laws or regulations, and they're putting more onus on third parties. So it can't be, this is how things were in the past. Okay. So a company, a first party data company gives data to a third party and the third party like, well, we just did what the company told us to do. And it's like, that's not sufficient. So you still have obligations, even if that data was given to you by the first party. And this is, you know, I talk to developers constantly. So people developing software and stuff like that. And so this had in the past have been a very prevalent way of thinking and just like you said people were thinking about the business right they're thinking okay this is my this is the job that i have to do to do the business that i've been asked to do but now this is extra layer in privacy regulation where they're like okay you have these other obligations that you maybe didn't know that you had before but now we're putting you on notice that you have it yeah i mean like exactly that like most folks at organizations, like I've been part of, you know, companies of, you know, very small size of where I'm employee number one, we scale it up or employees of 500 employees to even 20, 30,000 employees. And it's at every size of business. The constant is we're always trying to move fast and push up our weight. Um, and I think that's, that's part of the challenge. And I, I feel the same feeling as well, being part of a startup um, is that companies are always trying to move fast and push up their weight. And when there's extra steps or extra precautions that need to be considered or taken, those are often overlooked and you often prioritize that with everything else that you have um, in motion currently. Um, but it is nice to see these U S states put more of a onus on, you know, uh, put, put more of a focus, I guess I should say on sharing data and how it's shared in or out of your organization. And I'm, I'm very thrilled to see that. Um, I think it's a, it's a positive step forward, but I still think it comes down to a mindset and a culture change across businesses, which I feel like is just going to take some time. Um, and again, I think, you know, it'll be at a point where companies where, you know, it might be, maybe it's not so much the, um, regulation that's driving that and, and, you know, concerning folks within a business, but perhaps it's the, it's the mindset of the individuals in the business where they would think, you know, as a consumer, as a user of this business, you know, how would I want my data handled or how would I want my data protected? And I think that might be the, the shift you start to see. And that's what you think you see in Europe. And I think, you know, the U S is, is starting to follow suit on that. Um, here in Canada, I think we kind of see a hack medium of both. Um, we're kind of this hybrid. I think 
you know, for the most part, I would say privacy is a human right over here. Um, but I still think, you know, people's maturity of that is still, is still, uh, you know, at least to understand that it is still being, is still evolving. I think the consumers in Canada are still ahead of the businesses, uh, from that regard. I agree. Uh, what, what what's happening now i know that you keep up with the news stories and you're very plugged in to what's happening around the world with privacy but what in the data privacy universe right now is kind of concerning you about the future like what's what's down the pike that's concerning you um so i'm going to speak about in canada right now uh, they're talking a lot about digital identification we have a lot of vaccine passports software rolling out uh, a lot of it seems to be unorganized, off the cuff, one off companies or newer, you know, founders coming in and building this very fast to meet these, you know, timelines being put out by the government as far as when they want this in place. And there's a, there's an example up here in Canada. Um, there's a, a vendor or provider that just launched on the App Store. Um, and, you know, they outsource a lot of their development, you know, they outsource a lot of development, which, you know, I'm not against anyway, but I, I don't think it was the most, you know, they, Essentially, they, they didn't put in any proper screen measures in place, and a publisher or a, a major news publisher up here in Canada actually managed to breach all the information on that. And I think that's the big concerning thing to me is, you know, although I, I appreciate the shift to going more digital, uh, you know, I appreciate the shift going more digital, but when we start talking about, you know, implementing driver's license and, and health IDs or social security numbers through a digital application, it really concerns me about the amount of data collection that's going to be happening, um, more so from the government, right? Um, I think more and more people are starting to not trust the government, uh, although we have seen it historically in certain, depending where you're based out of. Um, we're starting to have more. We're starting to have more. We're starting to have more across the globe, uh, and that's kind of what comes down to my mind is okay. When does this turn to a social score? Uh, and you know, what's the impact of all the data being collected and, and the use of this, and you know, uh, the accessibility of these of this new tools? Well, um, that really I find a lot of governments are now trying to push to be more digital. At least in Canada, they are. Uh, and I'm scared about the repercussions of that and the data collected and, and how it'll be used and handled and even potentially used against the individuals or the data subjects. This is my biggest concern. And and uh, that's what's kind of yeah running through my mind a lot um, when I see a lot of this privacy news. And it's not really, I don't think there's a lot of focus. Uh, you know, there's a lot of protests sometimes we see around, you know, folks don't want the, the vaccine passport. But I think a good reason why not to want is for is for privacy, is your rights. Um, and being able to consent of, you know, if your information's, if they can collect your information or not. I think, you know, we're seeing that in Canada being whittled away slowly. Yeah. So just to your point, uh, there was an article, I can't remember what, I don't know if it was advice or something, but there was an article that was talking about the New York uh, Excelsior Pass. So that's literally like a vaccine passport where you can say that you've had your COVID vaccine, and then they actually have a partnership. Um, I don't know if Excelsior, I think Clear has a partnership with Open Table. So, like, if you book a reservation for a restaurant, they'll say, Oh, you know, tie your vaccine passport to this, and we'll, you know, we'll let you in. So, one thing that was really interesting that I read that article about the Excelsior Pass is that they, I guess, in their contract, I think IBM wrote, did the app, but in their contract, they want to be able to do other things with that data, right? And yep. so we know that's going to happen. Uh, yeah. and, the, and, and this goes again back to this kind of third party risk thing where, uh, well, it actually goes back to kind of consent of how people are using these tools because it's like, okay, I gave you this data for one purpose and now you want to use it for some other purpose, you know, because now that the capability exists, you know, they say, okay, well, we can do this for a lot of stuff. We can do, you know, for school lunches or for your driver's license, or, you know, and then just the, having that culmination of data collected, um, you know, can, can create risk for the individual, especially if the data is being used against the person. Like maybe, maybe you have a risk score or something and you don't, like if you don't get the, pet, the vaccine or something like that. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I a hundred percent, you know, yeah, it's, 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 I understand the, the purpose of it and the objective of it. And I a hundred percent, you know, I'm all for safety. So, you know, and I'm all for that. You know, I would, it's a, like, I prefer there's more of an opt-in mechanism. You know, if you want to use your, your paper, like in Canada, we have these, you know, paper slips. If you want to use that, you should be able to use that. Um, the idea of phasing that out for a digital option, 
um, that you don't really have much of a choice to to access certain things, you know, whether it's, you know, social settings such as movie theaters or restaurants, you know, you're kind of limiting people's rights a lot there um, of, of having to force this, right? I understand, you know, businesses have the right to protect themselves and protect their, their, their employees of people being vaccinated all for that 100%. But the concept of a digital passport um, and that have, that being mandatory is, is, is concerning. I think, again, you just don't know where that's going. And, and historically speaking, the government is known for surveillance and, you know, going above, going beyond what they're saying they're doing. Um, and I think that's, that's where a lot of the concern is. And I, I would hope you know, a lot of protests we're seeing in Canada anyways, I would hope that's why they're protesting as well. I haven't looked too deep into it. Um, but, you know, and the fast follow on that, um, again, they're talking about digital identities here as well, which I think is another interesting concept. You know, my father just got an Android phone for the first time four years ago, um, let alone I'm concerned about him getting, having to use a digital ID, um, pulling that up each time. Um, so just also the accessibility issues, right? Like that, that seems kind of uh, odd to me um, to move away from that. But again, you know, maybe if you're speaking to the, you know, if maybe you're speaking to Peter 15 years ago, I would have maybe had a different mindset. Um, but I think a lot has changed and technology, the, the amount of data collection that technology has now is, is through the roof. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I know we're, we're tech savvy and we're very plugged in, but also I'm a concern that, you know, not everyone has a smartphone. So all these things presume that you have it. So there are a lot of people who are going to be shut out of these things, especially if they're mandatory. If they can't, you know, um, if, it, if things are made in such a way that people can't operate and do things in life without smartphones, that like could be a problem. So like, you know, I think the difference is, let's say Apple. So Apple, they have a thing now, I think in their iOS 15 update where you can store your vaccine uh, card. And that's great if you want to do that. Okay. But they're a private company or a public company uh, within the U.S. and I mean, all over the world, and they can do that for their customer, right? So they're not everybody has iPhone. Not everyone is a customer of Apple. But then when you talk about the government, so everybody within your jurisdiction is your customer. So if you're not thinking about solutions that for people who have smartphones or people who don't have smartphones, you're going to leave a lot of people out because not everybody. I think the last statistic I saw is that in the world, I think smartphone usage is about 45%. So 45% yeah. of the population have smartphones. So the majority of people in the world don't have smartphones. Yeah. And then you also like in Canada, the system they're, they're, they've introduced is a QR code. So that QR code needs to be scanned by a smart device. And so those businesses need a, need a, need a mobile phone. I went to the movie theaters a couple of nights ago to watch Dune, which is a great movie, by the way. Um, but, you know, they have all these, you know, young kids working and they all have to have smartphones. Like, What's the cost on that for, you know, a smaller business? Uh, you know, movie theaters is a, it's a different level because, you know, you have a bunch of people coming in at once to go see a movie. And, you know, there's, there's lineups obviously to get in to, you know, get this scan your QR, uh, your QR code. Um, but just the, the the cost of that, and even for a small mom pop shop downtown Toronto, where you know you probably hardly even had a point of sale system, uh, right? You might be using an old fashioned cash register till. We see I see them all the time, you know. Let alone you have to get a, you know get a smartphone and scan that make sure you have Like it's 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 a bit of a mess uh, in that regards. And I don't think there was a lot of you know. Sometimes I wonder how much thought was put into some of these, uh, to some of these in these scenarios. Um, that, that we're seeing kind of come into place now. Yeah. Not, not to pick on the Excelsior Pass again in New York. I just read this article, but they were saying that uh, they were surprised that very few companies were actually had bought the device to scan the, the QR code. So they, so a lot of the majority of people, businesses that were using it, if they use it, they just let the person show them that they had it and that's it. So they didn't, they didn't spend the money to buy the device to scan the code because the way that their system works is when you scan the code, it not only, so, so you can store your vaccine passport on the phone, right? But what it is supposed to do is hook to a database in the state of New York to actually validate whether 
it's true or not that you had your vaccine. So that is, I think that was a very expensive thing to build into the application. And that's the thing that is not getting really used. So people are really looking at that really closely. Yeah, I mean, there's cost involved to building this tech, especially, you know, when you try to deploy it in such a short period of time, right? You're going to pay even more because, you know, you're, you're working against time and that's t- typically software vendors tend to do that. But there's also like the, the comfort level of the individual to put their data into the system. Um, you know, I'm certainly not comfortable, you know, inputting my health card information onto a website before I go in, before I go into a restaurant. Um, purely, you know, it can be a matter of if, you know, like maybe I'm not on a Wi-Fi network I don't trust. Um, you know, maybe I didn't read the price policy fully in time <laughs> to know what's happening with it. Um, things like that, I think it's just, that's why I feel the most, that's why I feel the worst about it, is individuals who are purely just not comfortable um, with this data being collected about them. Um, even when I went to get our co- my COVID vaccine here, you know, they said, you, you know, they kind of kind of list off some of our privacy rights. Like, hey, uh, well, they kind of list off like a very high level Coles Nose privacy a privacy notice in person, right? They verbalized to it saying, hey, you know, we're going to share information and we can share with whoever. Do you consent? And I said, do I have any other option? Like, no, you have to consent. It's like, well, then I guess I got to get this, right? Like, so it's it's kind of weird to me sometimes. And I understand the, the reason why, um, the reason why some of these controls have been put in place and some of these mandates, we'll call them. Um, but the but the human rights aspect being stripped away is significant. And I think more folks need folks on that part of it versus some of the weird conspiracy theory to hear about uh, online. Because that's the bigger concern to me with all of us. I keep my vaccine card with my passport. It's basically a passport. Like, so, okay, they need so to call your, it that. You have your actual passport, like your international passport. Yeah. <laughs> nice. So there's your, there's your Vax passport. Yeah. I'm, it's literally a passport. So you can't get into <laughs> places unless you have it. So I keep it with my passport. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, over here, they, they start with the slips that they hand out when you get your shots, which, you know, is effective. I have my slip in my wallet. Um, but more recently, they started rolling out. You know, I think some come, there were some private companies that started to try to get, get ahead of the game and try to be first to market on developing this, even though there's no official government contract. The challenge is that, you know, Canada, I mean, the population here is, I don't know, 13 million, or I guess it's a bit more than that, actually, uh, probably 20 million. Um, the challenge with that is, um, so I sure blank. I might need to cut this out. Um, the challenge with that, I was talking about the vaccine passports hitting the slip. Right. The challenge with that is that um, so you have these companies who went ahead and started building software without any government contract in place. They somehow managed to get press coverage uh, saying, hey, look, there's this, something on the app store now. I got all the major news outlets and you have all these individuals, you have all these people going in. And they just don't understand or they didn't know that this was an official app. It was on the news. So it seems official. And they put their, you know, they're so willing, a lot of people are still so willing to share their information. Um, and of course, there's 600,000, uh, you know, data subjects on that that were breached. And, you know, all the information that goes around that, including their, their health card information, uh, which, you know, you can log in now to the Ontario website, the, you know, province of Ontario website where I'm based out of and, you know, review your VAX status without a new secure password. You just need a year, you just need your, you know, first name, last name, postcode and your health card info. Um, and you can go ahead and see your vax, your vaccine status. Um, you know, it works really well, but I think there's 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 mass repercussions with that. Uh, and I imagine, you know, people know this and they're going to make these types of systems a big target for them, right? I mean, like, look at all the ransomware attacks we see a lot. I see, I'm reading a lot about in the US right now, um, but like, you know, these are great targets for companies for ransom. Um, yeah, I think, I think this is going to, we're going to be watching this really closely through the years to see how this sort of pans out and what happens with this data after, because we know it can, it can be repurposed for different things. Uh, what, if it was the world according to Peter, and we had to do everything that you said, what would be your wish for privacy anywhere in the world, anything, technology, people, what are your thoughts? Wow, that's a good question. Um. We'd say like we were kind of speaking to it earlier, right? Like any company can publish a privacy notice. They can go hire a counselor, or do it in house. But like I would like to see like in a perfect world, there's a way for me to go online and you know find a company that I don't know yet. I just found them online, but I like the service. I'm intrigued by it. I want to purchase it. You know, I always my first step is always reading those privacy policies and seeing how my data is handled, where it's located, etc. But being able to actually verify that they are doing what they say they're doing, and you know verify how my information is shared not just going off a, a legal, you know, like a piece of like a legal document, you know, um, 
you know, going beyond talking the talk and actually being able to see the walk. I think that would be huge. I think that's like my one wish is I want to be able to see the walk, you know, like that's what, that's more important to me than talk is like actually seeing the walk. But you just don't know. Um, you just don't know, you know, if they're actually saying, if, if it's actually true, if their privacy was actually true to what they're actually doing. Um, and that's my biggest like wish in the space that and like a big central delete button where I can hit delete and I'm just gone online and all those different systems. Um, but I would say, you know, more importantly is definitely, you know, being able to see the walk and, and actually verify that that's what they're actually doing. Yeah. I love that. I love that you're talking about it in that way. I agree. Uh, I think, yeah. Cause you said like, it's kind of like a paper promise otherwise. So it's like, yeah, we promise, we pinky swear that we do this. So we want to know if it's true or not. So being able to validate that, I think would be great. It would give a lot of customers a lot more comfort uh, if they were giving their data to people. And I think it would make businesses more profitable if they have customers that say, okay, we really trust these people because they really, you know, they really knit everything together really tightly. Yeah. And like one thing we hear of all the time in the B2B space, we sell to a lot of B2B companies is their customers audit them, right? Um, they audit them and actually make sure they have everything in place. Um, so I think it'd be something great to have something similar for actual data subjects or actual customers to actually be able to audit the business before they actually go do business with them. Um, however that tool looks like, who knows? Maybe we'll get there one day at Opsware. Yeah, yeah. Well, this was so much fun. I'm so glad we were able to, to get this done. It's, it's funny because you and I talk on a pretty regular basis, I would say. So it's nice to be able to do this podcast with you and be able to share kind of our secret conversations with the world. <laughs> yeah, likewise. Thanks so much for having me today. Um, really a pleasure to be on. You know, I'm a big fan of yours. And I love the content you put out. Uh, you're doing a great job on these videos, especially I like these short, simple ones you can now on LinkedIn. Uh, very insightful. I, I share them with our team sometimes. So thank you so much. And oh, thank you. I really appreciate it. All right, I'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Debbie. Okay.